So let's start. I think everyone here would be keen to know how you all came across your projects, actually, how, what was your in? And I mean, let's start with you, Felicity. You obviously didn't start on Tinder Swindler as the director. Mm -mm. Long story, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure this one's working. Can yes, you hear? Can. Yeah. Um, so when uh, the Tinder Swindler uh, came to Raw, I was heading up a development team there, the sort of feature documentaries and premium limited series. So um, the Tinder story had been broken by three brilliant journalists in mm. Norway and they wrote their piece in English called The Tinder Swindler and they had spoken, they had interviewed Cecilia and Penilla and they'd done six months of reporting. Their story went out and then was picked up by sort of, you know, global press and then a producer based over in LA, um, they then came to Raw because mm. it was a European story and partnered with us. So then I then spent a good couple of months just sort of delving into the story, figuring out how, it, as a development person, figuring out how we would tell it, and then pitched it uh, to all of the streamers. <laughs> <laughs> and then Netflix commissioned it as a feature documentary, and then at that point we were talking about, well, who would be good to direct it? And I had always felt developing it because we'd sort of developed it from the point of view, as being told from the point of view of the women. You know, mm. this is a story that should be about the victims, not about the perpetrator. And I had said, oh, I think a fi you know, it should be a female director. Um, and then qu quietly sort of said to my bosses, do you know what, I reckon I could direct this. And you know, they and Netflix brilliantly, you know, said, said yes. And you know, I had then the backing of um, two brilliant EPs at Raw, um, and then, yeah, we were off to the races. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, I think, first of all, that's so great to hear. I think we all, you know, I'm going to ask this later anyway, but, you know, we, we always say we want, we need more and more women, female directors. Do they get those opportunities? How do you, and it's so great to see three of the four are fantastic female directors, right? But to give that opportunity and to nurture and, and grow, I think, is really is really inspiring actually i think and i hope that hopefully that keeps happening more and more um emma going on to yourself now you've had quite an illustrious career should i say you know you Absolutely. you directed my favorite ever louis theroux a place for pedophiles nobody you, ever mentions that one <laughs> but it was my favorite it was my favorite you. uh you went to sp the series you were commissioning editor at channel four creative director at, uh, companies and now you've obviously founded and um, run your own production company, Empress Films. Um, so what brought you back to the director's chair? Um, yeah, I, like I, yeah, I kind of stopped directing for a bit and I kind of like went a bit corporate and it was really, bo it was quite boring being so corporate. Um, and I was creative director at Pulse Films and I made a series for Netflix about Madeleine McCann and while we were doing that, we interviewed this old, like this old guy in Ireland, in Southern Ireland, and he was just like following me around, saying, "Can you read this book about Marilyn Monroe, which he'd written in 1985?" And it was like <laughs> that big, and I was like, "Yeah, whatever, not gonna <laughs> read it, obviously." And then I got really ill with flu, and I was like, "Oh, I've got nothing else to do but read this book," and it was amazing. <laughs> and I wasn't really interested in Marilyn Monroe. Anyway, I read it and I was like, oh my God, there's like, it's written, there's loads of stuff here, I don't know. And I called him and he was like, oh yeah, I've got all these audio tapes in sheds by the river near my house. And I thought, oh my God, that could be amazing. And then I did a really weird thing where I gave up my job uh, and I started, started w I borrowed the money to uh, buy the rights to the tapes and I started making it unfunded, which I wouldn't suggest <laughs> people do that. Uh, but yeah, because I just wanted to do it. And thank God I... Sold it, but it took me like six months uh, yeah. to, to, you know, working on it with no money. I, I suppose Felicity and you both have said like you you had a passionate connection to an emotional connection, a kind of, yeah. um, you know, like a responsibility towards these. The, your both of your films. Did you feel that only you could direct Marilyn because yeah, of? It was weird, and like I went so meta. I've even got a tattoo of her on my <laughs> arm, <laughs> which is. And I was like, oh my god, I can't turn into that person because I do like really dark documentaries. I can't get a tattoo for every single one because that <laughs> would be really bad. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I did. Like I was sort of, sort of became obsessed with it in a funny yeah. way. I'm sure. Yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that when I met Cecilia and Penilla, they came into the offices for the first time and they were both so angry at Simon still. And I sat in a meeting room with them for about an hour and both of them were talking, 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 talking. Mm. 
And obviously you're thinking about the story, you're thinking about the film, you care about these people, but you're also like, these are brilliant storytellers. So I think from that point, we knew that, you know, just with the two of them, we had a sort of a special yeah. film in our hands and a real sort of call to action. You know, I felt so angry for them. And mm. um, I think that, you know, women who get, and men who get sort of, trapped into crimes like these can often be dismissed as being stupid and mm. how did you ignore all the red flags and um, your gold diggers and you know they showed everybody I hope a different side yeah that. no definitely and I, I, again I think that's what prop you know that's part of filmmaking isn't it just feeling that you have that story you can tell that story and you want to tell that story I think is really it's just again really inspiring I hope it's inspiring for a lot of the uh, um, guests here today. James, I look at your CV and I just am um, just awe-inspired. Like, you know, you've done documentaries on everything from the housing crisis to Gaza to North Korea to the 2011 summer riots. What brought you to Chernobyl? Um, it's a good question. It was about three years ago and the world had stopped. I was doing the riots film, we were in the edit, and basically we needed to carry on filming, we couldn't. So basically all my work stopped, dried up, I was stuck at home. And a bit like you, like people had recommended these two books on Chernobyl because like I've lived in Russia, I've been to Chernobyl, something I've kind of had an interest in for a while. And then reading one of these books in lockdown uh, on my own, going a bit mad, I think I'd shave my head at this point. Uh, <laughs> there was like a footnote that referenced this footage that was shot in the weekend after the accident. And it was shot on film by this just like amateur film enthusiast. And if you've seen the film, you'll remember it. And it's basically just like a perfect spring day, a bit like today, you know, mums pushing prams with babies and, you know, a wedding and kids playing in the sand. And then you just notice these like white flashes every now and then. Mm -hmm. And those white flashes are caused by the incredibly high level of radiation. And so these people for two days were carrying on as normal when there was an incredibly dangerously high level of radiation because of the accident. And the authorities didn't want to tell them because they didn't want to panic mm. the Soviet Union, so they cut the phone lines, and you know, so no, the rumors couldn't get out. And as soon as I saw this footage, I thought, I wonder what else was filmed. You know, if they were filming literally hours after the accident, yeah. like what else could we find? And then, because I had nothing better to do, just went down this rabbit hole of searching and just like finding more and more stuff. And, you know, it, it took another six months probably to get it commissioned after that. Mm. Um, and I was saying to, to Fliss earlier, like, I think probably if we'd, we'd been a bit more kind of American about it and been like, yeah, we've got this like amazing Hollywood material never before seen. But actually I was like so in it that I was like, I think we can tell this whole story through archive. But like, I didn't know. You know, and I guess the original idea, I don't know if you've seen Apollo 11, mm. which, which was like glorious, like beautiful film archive telling this amazing story of like America conquering the moon and like planting the American flag. And I always thought of this as like the kind of inverse of that, where it's like this crumbling empire. And through this event, you see the like corruption, the lies, it all kind of come crashing down. So the idea was always to tell it from like the perfect utopia that mm. they presented all the way through the accident to the fall of the Soviet Union. Yeah. And I think saying that to commissioners, and we're going to do it all through archive, they kind of looked at us a bit like, I don't know about that. So it was definitely a hard sell, and thank yeah. God Sky eventually came on board. But yeah, that was how, three years ago, exactly, that's how it started. It sounds like, all, you know, three of you, the, like again, the passion and the kind of perseverance with it. and. And, I, and kind of neatly brings me to you, Sophie. I mean, my dead body just blew me away. I, I can't stop. I well, first time I watch it and again watching it ahead of this. It just it's one of those dots that just burns into your brain and you can't forget because it's so layered and so beautifully made. Like, what brought you to what? What you know? How did you come to the to telling Tony's story? Um, I got I got a phone call one day. I was doing a I was doing a short film about Girls Aloud. <laughs> um, and yeah. uh, I got a phone call from um, Hannah uh, Brownhill at Maverick Television, and she—I've known—I haven't—I've never worked directly with Hannah, but we've known each other yeah. in the industry. And um, she phoned me up, and she told me um, that they potentially had this access, and that they were um, uh, for anyone who hasn't 
seen it. It's about a young woman who, um, when she died of cancer, and when she died, she's the first person in the UK to allow her body to be dissected, um, uh, have her uh, to allow her an anatomical dissections to be filmed and viewed by uh, a public audience. Um, and um, in you know, in an attempt to understand how cancer spreads, so doing it for science. So Hannah called me up and told me that um, that that they had access to uh, um, the uh, the lab that were doing these dissections. And my, my I had two reactions. My initial reaction was like, oh my god, what, you know how utterly. Um, huge, and then I also thought, ah, no, we shouldn't be filming that. That shouldn't be filmed. Like it's too mm -hmm. much. That they were my first two reactions, and so um, and Hannah was saying, look, we'd you know we would really like you to do it, and and Hannah had met Tony's mum and dad, and she said, I actually think that you will really get it, and you will really like her family, <coughs> you will understand it. So don't dismiss it straight away. So she left it with me for a while, and it was you know it's it, it was a it's a really tricky subject and so I said well look, can I go and meet Tony's mum and dad so I went and met her parents and they were they're just extraordinary mm. extraordinary human beings and then I went back to Hannah um, and she said right you know wh what do you think and I said I know what I don't want to do with this film and I'm worried that I'll be made to make a shock doc and I don't want to make a shock doc and there are lots of things I don't want to do and she said why don't you write an email to Channel 4 and say what you don't want to do and I was thinking, I was so sort of torn about whether yeah. to do the story or not. So I said, I don't want to do, I don't want to do a shock doc. I want to film it as beautifully as we can. I want Tony to own her own story and that it has to come from Tony. Um, I want Joe and Jason to have absolute editorial say if they want to pull out of this and they want to put a stop to it at any point, including at the end of the edit, mm -hmm. you know, which all the things that you're not ever supposed to do. As a commissioner, I've just gone like this. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> um, and to be fair to, you know, to Channel 4, they supported that because it was, you know, it was a mum and dad who were going to be watching their daughter being dissected into mm. tiny pieces. Like, none of us want... I've got a daughter. Mm. I don't want to see that in my lifetime happening to my daughter. They were willing to do that to educate people, to raise awareness. Also, the sort of sub -layer to Tony's story with, was that she was a woman who had been in a, a, a relationship for 10 years and been domestically abused by her partner um, uh, very violently, psychologically and physically. And the... The cancer diagnosis where she was told she was going to die was better for her than what she was living through. And she used that cancer diagnosis to get out of her relationship. So there were so many, and I just thought, and she was someone who didn't have a voice in life because yeah. she, you know, they are a family who are a working class family. They don't get to do all the things that we do in the world that we live in, in the world of media. And they wanted her to have a voice and so, so all of those reasons are why I did it. Sorry, I get quite emotional. No, about that it you should be. It was such an emotional story. I mean, you know, I think you can tell that again the care that all four of you have put into your documentaries. You know, and if, if that's what proper filmmaking is, right? If you care, you're passionate. And it doesn't matter if it's a documentary about giving, a, you know, a woman a voice or giving, like, almost like a, three women a voice or Marilyn a voice or, you know, survivors or victims of a kind of nuclear disaster. They're all very important and they are, you know, documentaries should be about giving a voice to the voiceless, you know, and, like, and, and we sometimes forget that because we get lost in notes or filming or what have you, but actually ultimately that's, you know, a wonderful thing that we can do. I think it's really important that you've highlighted that, actually, Sophie. And I wanted to, you know, talk about the actual, all four documentaries have a very distinctive approach to storytelling. And starting with you, James, I mean, how did you start with all that archive? <laughs> like, it must have been, you know, daunting, but also quite creatively kind of um, uh, exciting. Yeah, I mean, it was on one level, like the most satisfying, purest filmmaking experience I've had, mm. just because like compared to the logistics of like shooting with big crews and like, especially during COVID, like, you know, I spent half my time worrying about like visa restrictions in Japan or, you know, like all of that stuff that yeah. is basically quite boring. And this was just really simply, you know, it had its own challenges, but gathering footage, getting it together with the editor and just like crafting a film and figuring out ways to like solve creative problems. I, I guess like 
the most obvious creative problem is that there are like, it's an amazing how much was documented, but there are quite important moments that were not, like the moment of the accident. And you know, people had seen the drama probably, so they're used to like being in the room as these discussions are happening, as the drama, you're seeing the sweat on their brow. And like, to try, I think that probably put commissioners off as well, because they were like, you can't top yeah. the drama. It's been done, we've seen it, you know, and that was very true to life as well. So convincing people or actually managing to pull it off and it not feel like, you know, you were missing something. And the choice to not see people in filmed interviews mm. was, you know, hopefully in the end it came off, but there were definitely moments during the story, you know, we had this amazing interview with a firefighter who described going there, seeing, you know, being on the roof as it was like collapsing and everything. And it was like a hellscape. And you're like, this is amazing. But unless you can cut to him and see him, it's very hard to fake, for, you know, to cheat footage for yeah. a moment like that that's so specific. So we ended up like not using him. Um, but you do, you know, and I work with Rupert, who you know, Rupert Houseman, who's an amazing editor. M amazing, yeah. Um, and, you know, every challenge that we had, he turned into a way to elevate the film. You know, you're kind of challenged to tell a moment of the story in a way that's not literal. But you're like, I, I guess like our starting point was like, we don't want this film to feel like it was made by British people in 2021 or 2022. We want the viewer to feel like they've gone through the looking glass and they are in Soviet Russia and mm. everything about it is in that universe. And you're never, you don't ever feel like you're like jolted into the present day. So like even the bits that we filmed ourselves were supposed to be in that universe. Yeah. And so, yeah, we, I hope, you know, we, we just like figured ways out to, to solve those creative problems. And I think in the end, the film was stronger for it. Definitely. No, no, definitely. And I mean, Emma, to you, like Marilyn, thousand interviews, 650 yeah. on her yeah. tapes. Like, where did you begin? I, I want to know a little bit with that. I want to know about the lip sync because I oh, yeah. loved it. I thought it worked fantastically. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, there was like 700 interviews and they were all on like little cassettes that Tony had, had recorded in 1982. And so we got those cassettes and, and I got really lucky because the Academy in LA decided that they would digitize them all for because they're a historical record. So it's say like I didn't have that money. And then um, we had to listen to them all. And my assistant at Pulse, Eloise, she left her job as well. I don't know why we did any of this. <laughs> and there is a cafe in Heels uh, where you get free Wi-Fi. And they're really cool about you just sitting there, honestly, from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. You just like have like one cup of tea and they will let you. They're so sweet. I think <laughs> we gave them a thanks too at the end of the film. And we sat there, the two of us, in heels for weeks, just listening to the tapes. And then like Eloise is an amazing Gen Z, so she can just like cut sh together the, on a laptop. <laughs> like, what's all that about? And so she was clipping it, and so we got an audio string out. And then I man, and then I began to think about what is the story that we can mm. tell. Um, and then, yeah, uh, when we actually, get, like we shot the lip syncing is the last thing that we did. So it was probably like two or three years later. Um, and we basically got actors to lip sync the tapes because I j there were so many tapes. I just thought if you're just seeing a tape like going around, you're gonna get really bored. So we've got to bring them to life, but I didn't want to them to be like full characters that you had to go into their world and you would see see them like full frame mm. so we just kind of chose to do <laughs> to do their lips but i didn't realize that it's a really big ask for actors to do <laughs> that and they all turned up and they're all a bit grumpy with me because they said it was very difficult and i was like come on hurry up <laughs> it's easy <laughs> and it's actually not easy apparently <laughs> uh but well, yeah that's how it's i love the look of the interview is this you know the way you shot them as though they were in that period, and yeah. it matched the arc, the yeah. look matched the arc. Yeah. I thought just sim little, little simple things, really effective though. Yeah, and I, you know, so much of this is teamwork. I, I yeah. always work with the same DP called Jeffrey Sentamu, and he's amazing, and we just did it together. And he had a lot of those suggestions, and yeah. I just say, Yeah, great, Jeffrey, brilliant. Ah, uh, that's and nice. Did all that. That's really nice. Um, Felicity, what I loved about Tinderspiller was you had these three, these three kind of, like you said, giving the voice back to the women, their stories, and how they're all interconnected. And you did it like a thriller. Yeah. You know, tell me about that. Um, 
I mean, I, I've worked at Raw. I've worked at Raw for years, mm. and you know they've got a great skill. I think in making documentaries that feel like movies. So I feel like that's sort of ingrained in me uh, from you know learning from working on Don't Fuck with Cats with Mark Lewis, a great director. Um, and what I guess we had in our arsenal right from the start was the women had handed over their what's all of their whole WhatsApp yeah. record conversations with Simon, um, which I'm not sure I would have. <laughs> but no, <laughs> it was um, sort of just amazing actually to be able then to kind of see both the kind of online side of the relationship and then we spent hours and hours, I had an amazing producer working with me, did hours and hours of research calls. It was deep in lockdown, so fortunately Cecilia and Penilla didn't really have much else to do either, and we yeah. all sat on Zooms and got their story down. And then we were able to sort of piece together, okay, and it, it kind of started in the development process as well. This needs to start as a romance. Like, let's bring everybody into the romance of the story and how Cecilia was really swept off her feet and why she was somebody who was swept off her feet. Yeah. We were talking about, you know, she's a similar age to me. I've grown up on a diet of like rom-com movies and that kind of thing, that this is how love is meant to be. Yeah. And she had said, no, actually for me, it was all about Disney. That was, so then that we knew that with her that we could tell the kind of big romance, sweep the audience off, the, off their feet and give them the kind of Simon experience, the boyfriend yeah. experience. But then it turns kind of darker once, obviously, Penilla's involved and when you realise the crossover and then the kind of three cool Norwegian journalists. So we sort of went and tried to put the film into like more of like a Scandi noir kind of tone um, with them who then investigate and obviously, uh, you know, the scales fall from mm. behind Simon's eyes. And um, so it really goes from like a romance to a thriller to kind of cat and mouse and then a, a horror story for Cecilia, obviously, when she realizes that she's so deep in debt yeah. and that the man that she loved and she trusted and she'd slept with and was not who he said he was. And then with Eileen at the end, the kind of revenge story yeah. was just so good. And we actually didn't have Eileen when we were developing it. We didn't even know about Eileen because Simon hadn't even been caught yet. So he was still... Oh, really? At large, oh, yeah. um, which obviously was why Cecilia and Penilla were so angry and wanting to kind of make this film was like, let's expose this guy for who he is. Mm. Um, and then when Simon had been arrested, Eileen had actually messaged Penilla because she had seen the Norwegian newspaper article about the Tinder swindler. Mm. And she messaged Penilla saying, oh my God, I feel like I'm in the middle of a horror story. I'm going out with him. I don't know what to do. So we knew that she was there, but she wasn't sort of, you know, working with us at all. Um, and then it took, we were in the edit when we started conversations with her. So we sort of had Cecilia and Penilla kind of tell the end of the story. But then when we finally spoke to, Pen uh, to Eileen and she obviously told, I mean, she had dated him for 18 months. Um, but the, you know, the fact that she had gone over and stolen his clothes to make back some of yeah. her money. I mean, you just couldn't have written anything <laughs> like that. So... Um, so that was really excellent. And then I think the thing that really helped with the themes of the story was um, Jessica Jones's music. Mm. You know, she had a big hand on, uh, a big job on her hands of sort of taking the film from this big like Disney romance through to a thriller, through to this cool like revenge ending. So yeah, it was it was good to yeah. be able to jump from one to the other. It was brilliant. I mean, I think like again, all good docs raise questions, right? And I remember watching it when it first launched with my wife and going. Who would ever go on a first date and jump on a jet? And my, my wife went, I would have done. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, Sophie, look, I think the key thing for me was we talked a lot about giving voice to people, you know, voice to the voices. And you literally gave Sophie a voice through the use of AI, which yeah. must have been such a delicate and quite <coughs> a. Well, you must have thought about that decision for ages. I mean, how did you come to that approach? Um, well, as soon as, in that email that I wrote to Channel 4 at the beginning, I said in that that I wanted Tony to um, have a, you know, to tell her own story and for it not to be, I think, you know, when you die, I've made lots of films about dead people, and when you die, you become someone else's story, you don't become your own story, you become, you know, the version of, of your family and your friends. And so I was really, I really wanted her to tell her story, and she had, um, uh, her, her mum and dad had given me um, a, a diary that she had kept 
through um, the years of having cancer, it was four years from her diagnosis to her death, uh, that talked about her cancer, but that also talked about you know what she wanted for her two children. Mm. She had two young children. Um, after her death, um, she wanted to make sure that they weren't in their father's custody anymore because of the abuse. And so I, so I had a diary um, that she had written, and there was, and she'd also been very sort of out there on social media as well. So we had her words on social media and her own written word. And um, and then obviously, you know, we're all talking about AI, and I've been involved in other bits of development about using AI in films, and so. We um, started talking about whether we could turn her written word into her actual voice. Um, again, because she wasn't someone who had been on telly or anything. You know, we had about, I think we had about 10 minutes worth of her voice just yeah. from some, you know, a little bit of um, social media that she'd done and one two minute interview for local BBC TV. Um, and so we didn't have a lot of material, and I didn't know anything about AI at all at that point, so spoke to a company in the Ukraine called Respeacher that we ended up working with, um, and a couple of companies in the States, um, and the three companies were saying, you know, we need at least 20 minutes of um, her voice, and not 20 minutes of different clips of her voice, mm. but one, one clip that's 20 minutes long, and the two American companies um, we didn't go with them because they said they wouldn't be able to do it because we didn't have enough good material. And the Ukrainian company were absolutely extraordinary and they said, look, you know, we will try, we'll try our best. Um, and for those of you who haven't used it or who might not know about it, the way you do it is I take Tony's written word, um, you get an actor to, to record it, um, uh, and, and then you send that voice to the company in the Ukraine, and you, they create some kind of algorithm using Tony's voice, and they change the actor's voice into her voice. Because we didn't have very much material at all, um, they were saying, you know, this is going to be tricky, and your actor is going to need to really hear her voice, and have the right kind of cadence, the right kind of rhythm, you know, right. the right kind of accent, you know, it's sort of key to the actor doing the voice, actually. Um, and and so we were, and but the problem is when you do AI is you have to put down a lot of money for the algorithm to be made. That may not work, and you might just lose that money up front, you know, that you've put down, and it is a lot of your budget. Um, and the other deal we had with Tony's mum and dad was, you know, first of all, we asked if we could do that, but the deal with them was you get to listen to the voice first. Right. Um, and if you're happy with it, we'll use it. So we were taking a big risk on losing quite a lot of money because yeah. they could say they could have found it too upsetting and not wanted yeah. us to do it. Um, in the end, I thought, actually, who's going to be the person who, rather than getting an actor trying to mimic Tony, she's got two sisters who are in the film. And so I asked one of her sisters yeah. if she would um, do the voiceover and that we would use her voice to adapt it to Tony's. Um, and she did it. And it was, it, it gives me goose pimples now. We did the voiceover and the guy, the, the sound mixer that we were doing it with, he was sat next to me and I was concentrating on Kirsten, making sure she was okay because it was obviously a really emotional yeah. and some of the lines towards the end of the film are very emotional. And so I was just concentrating on her, wanting to make sure that she'd be okay. And then we finished the voice record and I turned around and this small sound mixer was sat there just like absolutely weeping yeah. next to her. So it was really, you know, it was, it was really special. And then... We, we sent it off to the Ukraine, they did the work on it, and um, they sent it back. And to be perfectly honest, I was thinking, does it sound like Tony or does it sound like mm. her sister? Because they sound quite similar. And so I took it to Joe and Jason, Tony's mum and dad, and we were, we'd been doing some filming on the beach in Deal. And I said, I've got Tony's voice on here, can we have a listen to it? And that was one of those moments where you decide, you know, because obviously years of working in film, you've got one voice saying you should film this moment. Mm. And then you've got your um, the the better voice in your head, yeah. which says this this is bigger than that yeah. actually. So just let them have this moment. And it was another really emo you know it was very it was very emotional. But then they said it's absolutely Tony, completely sounds like her, and yeah. they were happy for us to go forward. And it just meant that. And it's not like she narrates the whole film, but it just meant that she had a presence. Um, you know that I, I really really wanted her to have. I'm really glad you just said that because. I wonder if that was going to be my next question, which is I think all four of your uh, fantastic films, the key, the key contributors, you never meet. You're, they're never there. And quite in some cases, like with Simon, quite rightly, we, you know, this isn't his story, but you know, they are the, the drivers of the story. I mean, how, tell me a little bit about how you, how did you bring, how did you do so, um, how did you do Tony justice, Sophie? 
Um, by, by, I mean, I don't know, you know, maybe Tony would have said no to filming. This, that's something that all of us who were involved in the making mm. of it had to deal with. She said yes to having her body dissected in front of a public audience. There was nothing on that form that said, and will you be part of the documentary? Yeah. So that was her, that was for her, fa her family to decide upon. So you make those decisions um, together and then and then I immersed myself in everything she'd ever written, in everything she'd ever put on her social media, in talking to her, her friends, you know, get, getting all those different versions of her from different people, um, making sure that I treated her children in the way I know she wanted them treated, which would, was to not identify yeah. them, was to protect them. You know, Channel 4 have been brilliant. This film will only be out for another few months and then it will disappear so that those kids never happen upon the footage when they're older. You know, there's all there's so much that we put in place. There was psychological backup for everyone involved in the film. Everyone was, you know, had a psychological assessment b before taking part in the film. There was a, I've never worked on something where so much care has happened around it. And, and I was saying um, earlier, you know, I was, that I was so impressed with Channel 4 actually because... Honestly, it was the first Channel 4 film I'd done and I was worried because I uh, just of the unknown because I hadn't yeah. worked with them. And I just think it was in, you know, it was treated with so much respect and care. And so I think, you know, that's how we were able to make Tony own her own story because yeah. everyone came in at it with the same, you know, the same idea. That's really good to hear. God, I love Channel 4. Thank God the Tories <laughs> kept their hands off it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and um, with you, Emma, Marilyn Monroe, no... Uh, quite an icon, right? How yeah. did you, A, br do her, her story just yeah. but also bring her, the way you weaved her into the story yeah. as well? Um, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, I'm quite an odd person and with when I do a film and the person isn't in it or they're dead, I always go to somewhere where they have been and I ask permission, it's, I'm such a weirdo. So I went to Marilyn's grave before I did anything and it was mm. so embarrassing with all these tourists and I was like trying to do this like little speech but I didn't want anybody to hear me. <laughs> uh, so I was kind of like do lots of rounds of like saying, and by the way, I'm gonna do this. Anyway, so, but, but actually I think it, it, it actually is a, a, a sort of an intellectual process because you're just laying it out there first and saying, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna try my best to get this right. And it's sort of like, you're sort of putting a tent pot, you know, and I went to, you know, um, anyway, I'm not gonna go into that. Anyway, uh, so so I do do that first, and then, and then, and yeah, I mean, like, it's just, like, we're obsessed with facts, aren't we? And we live in a time where TikTok and stuff, this is my current bug, but I want my latest series is about. <laughs> TikTok, you don't, you don't check shit. You're like, oh my yeah. God, I've just found out that the thing you did that was, have you checked it? Yeah. So uh, I, j yeah, you just have to check and check and check, and then and then hope that you've got it right. So there's a lot of cross reference. It sounds so boring. There's a lot of cross referencing going on, and just making sure that we could tell a story that was right. It was very important to, to me that Marilyn's voice was in it, and you know I and and all those people who are in the tapes, every single person had been in a room with Marilyn, so they knew her. You know, it's like, you know, it's like the editor, Gregor Leon, said, it's like a seance, you know, that all the, all the people were dead. It's like, a, it's like ghosts of the past, and it did feel quite a responsibility to carve a way through that mm. that was right. So I just checked it and checked it and checked it and hoped that we got it right. And also I feel like she's a very, very modern woman, and so I really tried to bring that into it so that you felt by the end of it that that you could connect, like a younger woman could connect yeah. with all her insecurities and all of the things, how she was feeling, because it's exactly the same for us today. Yeah. And I, and I wanted young women to think, oh my God, if Marilyn Monroe, one of the most beautiful women in the world, can sometimes feel like shit and have bad relationships, then I'm okay. Do you know what <laughs> no, I mean? I, I was trying to kind of do that bit. I think, you know, when we, when we do docs that look back on a certain period of time and we revisit them with our, with our kind of perspective now, you do realise like, actually how she was mistreated. I mean, yeah. Arthur Miller, what a bastard, oh right? Oh, God, he's such a shit. Yeah. And I loved his and I'm book as well. Time Bends is one of my favourite books. Yeah. And then, like, oh, my God, I had to accept <laughs> no, but you that think how a horrible, horrible man. Horrible man. Who yeah. dis like, and you go, God, what she went through, and yet being yeah. this icon, but yeah. and how the whole, the whole world wanted a piece yeah. of her, right? And... Yeah, I'm going to see the Crucible in a few weeks. I don't know if oh I might God. give my ticket away. It's a good away. play, though. Um, James, obviously with you, it's kind of for me, it felt like there was two big presences in this film. One was obviously 
Chernobyl itself, the town, and bringing that story of that town alive. But then also Russia, right, in the time of the Ukraine invasion, and you realise that geopolitical, political kind of... How did you make such what could be potentially a dry subject come alive in your film? Um, I guess, yeah, we were always aware that it was this kind of epic, sweeping story, but we wanted to ground it in, per like most docs, you know, you, yeah. you want personal stories that carry you through that speak to the wider picture. So we, you know, we did audio interviews with like six or seven people, I guess. And through their personal stories, you understand the suffering and the experience of the, you know, and in a way not seeing their faces and just hearing their voices meant that hopefully you can kind of have your cake and eat it in that their story speaks to you on a personal, emotional level, but also they are speaking as part of a wider picture. Whereas like, I think if you'd cut to an interview of a middle-aged man, you're just so focused on that person, yeah. that individual, you're like, God, they've aged weirdly, or oh, they've aged differently, to, you know, or where are they there? You know, you just kind of, you're taken into the specifics and the present day, whereas like, just hearing their voice, they can speak as a representative of this bigger phenomenon, yeah. hopefully. And then we used the kind of Russian or Soviet state propaganda as a kind of backdrop. So at key moments, you would hear Gorbachev pop up and be like, everything's okay, yeah. nothing to worry about. <laughs> uh, and then you'd cut back to the reality of like calves born with two heads or, you know, babies born with cancer or, or all sorts mm. of horrible things. So I guess, yeah, it was like, we. For, for me, the, the the epic scale of it was like a challenge, but also, you know, exciting because it meant that we could kind of make the film feel really big and cinematic. And mm. like, as long as we landed those personal stories and did them justice, then the film would kind of work on both levels. Yeah, no, it did. It did. You know, that scale of it, like you said, but feeling connected to those people was was brilliantly told. And Felicity, Simon. Um, I mean, obviously, like, ha first of all, kind of bringing him into it, you know, when the villain of the piece that like, drives that story, but then also, like, I, I'm really fascinated to know how you were able to work legally to get him in because obviously they're quite, you know, he's never been, he's never been in prison for what what he did to those women. Like, how did you how did you balance the two? He has been in prison for doing a similar thing to, to three someone other else. women yeah. in Finland, though. So therefore. Um, you know, he'd done a very, yeah. very similar crime. Um, and really, I mean, the I guess it was just the luck of the fact that, you know, we film ourselves, you know, the women had filmed a lot with him and he had sent them a lot of voice notes and we were able to legally use those yeah. as well. So I think once we got their WhatsApp through and also the team, the Norwegian journalists had, had also gone through Cecilia and Penilla's WhatsApp, so we sort of knew that that was there mm. at the beginning of the process of developing the film. But then once you really get into them, and then we had every single voice note transcribed and was able to kind of build Simon, basically, into the structure of the film before we even did any interviews with the women. So we sort of knew that, actually, you know, there's a video of... The, you know, this interaction with Simon, or there's a voice note here that we can use, and therefore we, you know, don't need to have the interviewee tell us because actually that single emoji that he sends or that single voice note that he sends to Eileen at the end where he's, you know, being just pretty horrifically yeah. awful, to be honest, screaming and shouting at her because finally, finally, he's like, you know, trapped in a corner and can't get out. So I think from the very start, we knew that he would have a presence in the film, which you know, with stories like this, it would be difficult, I think, to get the perpetrator mm. of a crime to uh, be in a film. And then also, how do you interview somebody that it would, you know, possibly be an unreliable narrator? Yeah. Um, but, you know, we did speak to him during the process, so he knew that the film was being made, and we gave an, him an opportunity to be interviewed, should he wish to be. And I think that he was very aware of the story that had broken in the press about him. So I think he knew the, that we were speaking and, and wanting to kind of put the victims front and centre. Um, but actually, we didn't need him in the film. And I personally, you know, I think I cared much more about what the victims mm. had to say rather than, you know, Simon having a platform to tell more lies. Yeah. You know, that was never what we wanted to do with the film. So 
I think it links in what Emma said. The facts were there, right? They were yeah. there in audio and visual kind yeah. of evidence. So you let him tell his own stories that way because he kind of hung in, like, you know, you gave him enough rope and he hung himself because you saw it all. So I thought it was great. I thought it was great. I'm quite conscious of time. Uh, so I might just ask a few more questions and then we can open to the audience. Um, I want to um, I want to ask you quickly about your relationship with the editor on this, like because they're all brilliantly crafted films, and obviously that is a key part, you know, it's an important part. I mean, um, James, you said you worked with the fantastic Rupert Hausman. How was like? How did you craft that film together? Um, yeah, I mean, th I've, that was the second film I've made with Rupert. We're making another one now, so it's a good relationship yeah. at the moment. And he, you know, he's brilliant. We complement each other really well. I, I kind of knew the first time I worked with him, it was a film about the riots. And again, he has just like a magic touch where even like when he does a rough cut, it just feels like cinematic and elevated. And like with the riots film, it was again, it was like a kind of something, it was in the UK, but it was something that started small and like spread. And, uh, you know, I knew that again, it needed to be like strong personal stories, but something that you felt was like, Elemental was just like you know bigger than kind of individual stories and something that was like sweeping a country, and he just has that magic touch. And so, yeah, he, I think it was his seven seven film that he did years ago that yeah. I was just like, this guy is just a genius. Um, and so, yeah, I loved working with him on the riots and then Chernobyl. He was just like the obvious person, and I think for an editor, it's like a dream yeah. to work. You know not have to rely on your director to gather footage, but just to be like yeah. handed yeah. something to just whittle down. And the good thing as well is like it was shot in the Soviet Union on film. So it wasn't like there were like thousands of hours, you know, it was like dozens of hours in, in total. Mm. But like compared to some films you make now where there's, you know, just like hundreds of hours shot. Um, so yeah, and it was, it was a joy. You know, we had a really supportive exec, Sky were really constructive the whole way through. And just like from the very beginning, bought into what the film was, the concept. Like people from other, like commissioners from other streamers have said since the film went out, like, thank God we didn't take it because you wouldn't have got to make that film. And All it right. just, they would have tried to make it something in their own image. And, you know, it just, for, from my perspective, it needed to be that, you know. Yeah. And like if you tried to, I don't know, do, do like dramatic reenact or whatever, I don't know, it just would have like broken the spell. And so, it, you know, Rupert and I had a great time. It was like just kind of thinking up creative solutions to problems. And you've got this kind of, you know, this so Soviet archive that you can just dip into to try and solve different gaps mm. and whatever. And it was, um, yeah, it was a really collaborative, lovely experience. And like so much of the film is in the craft. So, yeah, um, yeah I loved it. Brilliant. I mean, Sophie, you had... How, working with your editor, you obviously had like, I kind of felt you had like those two narratives, right? Tony's story and then obviously the, the, the public dissection. I mean, how weaving them two must have been. Yeah, it was tricky. Originally, I wanted to um, tell the story backwards <coughs> so that you meet, you know, so that you, because the first time you meet Tony in the film is, you know, is literally her dead body. And so to tell her story backwards and it just, what I hadn't worked out um, ahead of getting into the edit was then when you've got uh, your sort of actuality and the dissections happening going forwards, then to have a story going backwards, you know, a personal story going backwards, there was a bit where we, you get to the middle and it all just goes, um, it just doesn't work. So, um, so we did a lot of kind of reorganising, working out how to put it all together but it was yeah it was it, it, it it's one of those that you know once you've done it you're like that looks like that was really easy <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's because of all of the work that went in and um, it was Matt Lowe who was the editor and he was great and again it was about working with someone who absolutely um, could cope with the material mm. you know because some people just said no to making the film because they wouldn't be able to wow. cope um, and um and someone who would treat it with the care that it needed, and someone who was on my side, who, you know, there were some bits of footage that no one ever saw because yeah. we knew we'd be forced to put it in, and you have to make moral decisions. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, someone who's got your back, and he absolutely had my back. And I think you can tell that from the, f from the documentary itself. It is very uh, respectful. 
you know what I mean? And it would, could have gone either way. Like you yeah. said, it could have gone into shop doc yeah, trade yeah. really easily, but it wasn't. It was a really respectful, beautifully made kind of tribute, you know, and a celebration of, of a life. Uh, and yeah, like exactly, I think, like you said, it was Tony's story. And, and I think also across. from thinking about that beauty thing as well, I hate watching grim stories that are shot in a grim way or have or shot as though they've got a low budget just because they're grim. Like, mm. I feel like you have to do, you should do the complete opposite if you've got a really grim story and make it as beautiful as possible. And so the DOP that we work with as well, that was a key person who I knew was going to bring a look to the filming of it that yeah. was, you know, that those rushes would be beautiful. We weren't having to fix those rushes in the edit. Yeah. And Felicity, you, you know, we talked a lot about the different almost filmic genres that your uh, documentary did. I mean, how was that in the edit, kind of tonally and getting the pace right for all of, or as the story progressed? Um, well, I was really lucky to have a fantastic editor, Julian Hart, mm. uh, working on the film, who's just a wonderful person through and through. Um, but I think it, the, the film itself, the fact that it does take you on a journey was yeah. obviously fun in the edit. And, you know, there was some careful scripting that went on and before I had my interview shoots, Julian, you know, read my scripts and we talked about them. So he was really kind of collaborative with me right from the start, which was just fantastic to kind of have another brain on it as well as obviously the EPs. Um, and then just in the edit, I think the thing that none of us appreciated was going to take as much time as it did was obviously we had to build these graphics. Mm. So we didn't, um, you know, it wasn't a graphics company that we sent these off to and send us back all of these WhatsApp messages. We hired an amazing AP called John Mark who had a Cecilia phone or a Penilla, Penilla phone yeah. and a Simon phone. And then we literally had to text and screen record back and forward. So I'd be Simon, he'd be Penilla, I'd be, you know. Really? So oh that wow. we could then feed the graphics, which yeah. then became, you know, pretty much a quarter of the film are these graphical rushes that then we had to work within the film, which was kind of quite great because it wasn't like we were filming them beforehand, like you do interviews and then you come back and you think, oh gosh, I didn't get that bit of sync. You know, we had, obviously, we were limited to what was said in the WhatsApp transcripts that we had been given by Cecilia Panilla and Eileen, but you could kind of think, oh, like look at the tension between this little emoji or, you know, maybe he didn't actually text back until the following morning. So yeah, yeah. let's leave that time <laughs> that passes where obviously when you're in the beginning of a relationship or whatever, you're just waiting for that person to message back. But, I mean, it was just incredibly time-consuming. And, you know, Julian worked for hours and hours and hours. Obviously, you could go on forever with graphics, with mm. these kinds of graphics. Um, but, yeah, just did such a, a, a amazing, amazing job, you know. But the editors, obviously, um, musically, you know, we all work together with the composer, but really, you know, the editor is kind of... Um, uh, driving, driving that forwards, and um, we, we were using sort of temp music. Th I think it was from Bridgerton actually for the <laughs> beginning, and um, yeah, it was one of uh, you know just a really formative relationship for me as well. Being mm. a first time director, just also having an editor there who, I mean, has zero ego. You know, wasn't thinking that this was his film that he you know yeah. really wished that he was. Directing, not that you know, editors are like that, but I think I was a bit nervous and thinking, well, I'm going to get into the edit, and will I be listened to? And you know, he was just fantastic. That's yeah. really good yeah. to hear. That's yeah. really nice to hear. And and Emma, like different styles, different like archive. Yeah. You, know, you know how lip sync or yeah. how did that go back in the um, edit? So I just can't script, so I don't script. Please do buy a film off of me, but <laughs> I don't script. I just can't do it. So I get into edits like unbelievably quickly because I have to feel the material, and I just my brain just doesn't work in that way. So again, that's why I love having Gen Zs and millennials around because they could just like bash things out <laughs> like, on the tube. Uh, and so Eloise, <laughs> she like cut it for like six months. And it was amazing because we do need more female editors. Yeah. There aren't any. So she went from being my assistant and she cut the whole of Marilyn um, enough for us to take it to Netflix and they bought it. And now she has got credit as an assistant editor on it and she's just cut one of my uh, films, my next films for Netflix entirely herself. Um, and then Netflix gave us the money to bring Gregor Leon on. And it was just like, oh, my God, he made it into a movie. I didn't. And he's just an amazing human being. And like, I think we all say the same things. Like, that's when you're like, 
whatever those people do is extraordinary yeah. and so he kind of took it from the story to what it is so it was just amazing working with him and it's so good to hear that you've all had great relationships with you know in the edit room because every part of filming is key right we all know that every part of the production is key but a film can be made or bro broken in the in the edit as we all know and it's so good to hear that especially nurturing editors as well um you know and the fact that you continue to nurture future editors um no i know we're running out of time we've got five minutes i'm going to rattle quickly through them but um when when all your films launched obviously you know i just want to know a little bit about the reactions to them and also how you continue to care for your contributors afterwards so um I mean, look, Felicity, Tinder Swindle, as I was saying to you earlier, started a whole genre of true con. And, you know, the reaction was everybody was watching and everybody I knew talked about it. But how did you, A, tell me a little bit about that, but also caring for your three, you know, for Cecilia, uh, Pranilla and Eileen afterwards, because the whole world must have been yeah. focused on them. Yeah, I mean, we um, had a really close relationship with them anyway, the, the producer yeah. and I, because we'd spent so long talking, you know, obviously working with them and talking to them, and we showed them the film beforehand. And Netflix has a really brilliant duty of, you know, duty of care set up, so they had access to, you know, any support that they sort of needed. And we just set up, you know, we have a separate um, WhatsApp group, I mean, uh, called <laughs> Tinder Support, just with the producer, me, the three women, um, and the thing is, n none of us knew that the film was going to be as big as it was. Um, you know, what y you have th three n women who, well, first of all, there's the, victor the perpetrator isn't in it. Yeah. Then you have three women whose first language isn't English. So actually, there was a, a lot sort of working against it. And we loved it and, you know, were really thrilled with it. And then just never, never in a million years expected it to sort of um, blow up in the way that it did. And then obviously that came with, you know, a lot of s stress and kind of, the, you know, the women being, you know, on chat shows and talk shows and this morning and all of these kinds of things. But, you know, we would often just speak to them and check in with them obviously all the time. We were all texting every day just because I think that launch to fame really you know they went from yeah. having a thousand followers on instagram to having 350 thousand followers on instagram i mean it was crazy yeah. um but you know they i think are really really thrilled with the experience and um are all doing their own things now and um you know i i hope are very very happy mm. um i mean i haven't heard otherwise but yeah we're all sort of checking with each other all the time so great. yeah and <coughs> you have to do that i mean i think it's really easy for us behind the camera to sort of you know and then move on to another project mm. afterwards to sort of forget that you know actually there's you know something out in the ether that's going to you know not in your case but could forever be there and yeah. i think you have to keep that relationship going and they have to know that you are there and that you know that that they are really, really important people to you. Um, yeah. Definitely. No, I think that's really, again, brilliant to hear. And um, and Sophie, obviously, with um, Tony's parents and Professor Claire Smith, I mean, that relationship must have, you know, how has that continued post uh, TX? Yeah, I mean, it's fun. It, when when I, I started off at the BBC and I was there for 10 years and you used to have these, um, like, appraisals once a month. They were called something else, routines they were called. And um, and I used to get the, you know, they'd have to say all the positives and then have a bit of criticism. And the bit of criticism every single time was you get too close to your contributors <laughs> um, and you need to not be so close to them. What and, ridiculous um, thing to say. And I would say you get the films you get because I get close yeah. to my contributors. And that's my choice, not, you know, anyone else's choice. Um, and so it's the, you know, I, I do that with every film. I think as I've got older, one thing I have learned is also that they don't, I stay in touch with them, absolutely. But I'm not a big thing in their life. Yeah. You know, they have bigger things in their life. They don't... I, I, I used to have an ego and I used to think, I need to control this and yeah. keep letting them know that I'm here. And, you know, and I will always be in touch with Joe and Jason. We've been through something, you know, huge together. But I also know that I am not important in their life. And so we check in. I make sure that, you know, it was a difficult story to tell. So I'm making sure that any award ceremony we go to... 
I take them to it. It's not me that goes in there and does it. So we went to the RTS Awards. We were kicked out. We were the last ones there. We were there until <laughs> 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, just because they've told a very difficult subject doesn't mean that they don't know how to have fun in their yeah. lives and they're not just human beings. Um, I've already said how all the duty of care stuff was just brilliant by Channel 4, and that continues, and the support is always there for them. But I think it's also just, you know... When we go to when we've been to RTS or BAFTA or whatever, you know, it's brilliant and they love it. But you know, we talk about this bit's just the pantomime. You know, this is just a pantomime. So get, have fun. You know, yeah. it's a party. Don't be intimidated by it. Don't feel, you know. And that's what we've done. And I think that's, you know, and I will stay in touch. And w that will get, you know, those distances will get longer and longer. And we'll put it'll be Christmas cards and birthdays and Tony's anniversary, and that's fine. You know, mm. because. I'm not part, I arrived in their life a year and a half ago and their life carries on yeah. w without me. So yeah, it's there, but I don't, I don't feel, you know, we have to be all over each other. Exactly, yeah. And, right. and they're obviously welcome in my life whenever they want. And, and James, with your doc, obviously, you know, with what's happening in Ukraine, it felt like a very, you know, timely, but I hate saying that because it's almost cynical, isn't it? But it felt, it was kind of a weird time for that doc to launch, but also felt very timely. And uh, how did that, how did your documentary go down? Um, yeah, I mean, we finished the film a couple of days before the invasion. So then by the time it went out, about a week later, it felt almost irrelevant. Um, yeah. And yeah, it was unlike any film experience I'd had before because, yeah, I mean, when the invasion started, I was getting voice notes from people saying, you know, I'm hiding in a cellar, there are bombs falling. Um, so, and yeah. It was a very kind of surreal, it was like a fever dream. You know, I didn't sleep much for the first like week around that time. And then, you know, we've kept in touch, like uh, Ludmilla, who's one of the central characters of the film, who loses her, her husband and then her baby. Um, her son was quite badly wounded in the war. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, spent a lot of time tracking down which hospital he was in and finding someone to take money to her to buy him medicine. And, so it's been, you know, a kind of long, an ongoing relationship with lots of them, with people who've been through, you know, enough tragedy for like five lifetimes. Um, so, yeah, it's, I, don't, I mean, I think they've all seen the film and liked it, but it, yeah, like I say, it just like pales into insignificance. I think, you know, I think they were, Did Miller, for instance, was like happy that she, got to tell her story in her own words. She, she'd been featured in the HBO drama and wasn't mm. thrilled with it. Right. She, was, she just felt like it had been, her trauma had been taken away from her. And you know, I understand where she's coming from, it's obviously complicated. But for her to have a chance to you know, speak over real footage and tell her story herself, I think was important. So you know, I'm, I'm happy with that, but yeah, it's just a film. <laughs> Yeah, and it, you know that's it, her story was the one that struck me the most, partly because of the drama. So to hear that actually now she does that she has ownership of her story, I think is is really is that's again the power of documentary, right? That what we can do and that responsibility you know you all have like you, that you've done so well with and honoured. I think is really good to hear, really good. And Emma, Marilyn, like how what was it? a. God, everybody was dead. It was amazing. <laughs> um, I mean, like, the duty of care thing is, like, you literally start thinking about that duty of care before you start your yeah. film. It's so integral. So it was a bit of a holiday for me. So I didn't have to worry about it too much. But I thought that one of the things that was really interesting, like, when it came out, some of the older critics in Hollywood were mean. And I, you know, have to, you know how you have to keep your mouth shut. And I wanted to say, mate, I didn't make it for you not interested yeah. in what you have to say, old man in Hollywood. And then all these young people like just rediscovered her and connected with it. And so that was the nicest thing about the whole process for me because that's what I was doing it for. I do like older people, I am older. <laughs> I'm just saying that I just, you know, I, I thought it was interesting that it was a story that some people think that they've got ownership of and yeah. they don't like it when you try and tell it in a different way and they like to tell you that you're doing nothing different on you. God, I sound bitter. No, I no, I think that's really important. Like, off. <laughs> no, but again, again, I think like, you know, it's a woman whose story has been told so many times, yeah. right? And actually telling it from a different perspective and, and in a, in a way, giving her her ownership back, I think, is really yeah, important. Yeah, and then it was right? really interesting. They just did exactly what they've always done <laughs> to her, and then they did it to me too. But anyway, yeah. that's in the past. We've run out of time, haven't we? Uh, 
Does that, can, I, can we get one question? One question. Has anyone got a question? Um, the lady who's got her hand up in the middle. Yeah. Um, I just have a question for Emma. I'm very sorry to the rest of you. Uh, but you mentioned you were doing a project, an upcoming documentary on TikTok, and that sparked my interest because I have quite a large platform on TikTok called Callahan's Questions, where anyone can send an anonymous question about any topic, and I answer it factually with evidence-based information, no stigma, just trying to make the world a bit more of an educated place. And one of the things I find myself coming up against constantly is I will never be as appealing as misinformation. And misinformation travels so much faster online than factual evidence-based information. So I just was curious about your opinion on what the long-term ramifications of that will be. Particularly, you mentioned Gen Z and millennials. Most Gen Z people get their news from social media now. So I was just curious what you thought the long-term ramifications would be, and I'd love to talk to you more about that after the panel, if that's Great. okay. Great. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I, I think it's a blessing and a curse. I, I love TikTok. It's a great place to be. Uh, but when my kid starts not understanding about Andrew Tate, and then I say, check your sources, check your sources, and he doesn't, and he's been brought up by a feminist single mum. Do you know what I mean? It is a bit scary. So I don't know what we do, but I guess like the conversations that we have, you know what, I think it's just not important that the four of us and people like us remind people that all our entertainment and all of our stories is based on cross-checking facts. And it sounds so boring but it's kind of going to be very, very important yeah. to all of our realities yeah, yeah. as we move forward, really, um, in society. But actually, actually I was going to say, or I think all f the remaining three directors can also talk to that because, in a weird way, a lot of your docs are about misinformation and misinterpreting of facts. Yeah, so I was just going to say, I mean, I'm sure, it, for, uh, you know, like Emma, we've been making films for a long time, and I don't think... I was making films before social media appeared, and the mainstream media have always had... The voice and it's not ever been true or always been true and facts have always been you know that it's it was ever thus right so it's um yeah it's about personal responsibility in making sure we educate our children our, our friends to you know the, the next generation coming up to go and look for um the right kind of information i think actually to spin it to a positive because of all the platforms we've got um, if we teach people to go and look for that information it's much easier to find mm. you don't have to go down to an archive library and go through loads of old newspapers and spend a whole day there you know it's at the touch of a button so it's just it's yeah it's using it um, yeah, it's using it the right way but I think it were, it was ever thus um, and so it's it's about education it's about um, integrity um, and it's about you know passing on the right messages as individuals you know mm. not just filmmakers or any, any other role that we might have but just as individuals in our own circles and and James I mean your big part of your documentary is about misinformation of facts isn't it and I yeah, and I mean, you know, even looking at the war in Ukraine now, it's like Putin is using the same playbook of lies and misinformation, and social media has been a great outlet for that in terms of spreading those lies around the world quicker than the Soviet Union yeah. could. Um, so, yeah, I don't know what the solution is, but, I mean, it is, it's scary. The, um, the Ukrainian company that we worked with doing the AI, we did what, it was a classic TV Zoom call with um, commissioners and executive producers and everyone on it, and our absolute naivety and ignorance um, in, you know, compared to what they are going through, and someone asked, um, and I, and I could, it could have been me, it wasn't me, I was just, one, it was one of those <laughs> situations where I was so glad it wasn't me, who, it, someone said, um, we're just wondering, but the work you do, I mean, is it on dry, you know, because there are troubles happening, it was just, you know, when it was all kicking off yeah. in the Ukraine, and they were worried about whether, you know, if they did this work, the dry would get blown up somewhere, and we wouldn't have oh. uh, the material, it was, it was one of those <laughs> awful, awful, on, and these guys are like, and we love how you guys think this is just happening now, you know, and yeah. that's, uh, and, it, and, and so it is, it's about seeking out what's the right information. Don't believe the little tiny bits that we try and do in our documentaries, you know, there's big, you know, there's so much information out there to find out what's really going on. Yeah. Um,